This tutorial will demonstrate how to track DC power consumption with a Raspberry Pi. An INA219 will be used to measure voltage, amps, and watts. My videos are fast paced, but all the code, notes, updates, and more are available on my website, and a link will be placed in the video description. Here's an old cordless drill motor hooked up to a small battery. I replaced the trigger with a potentiometer. Turning the pot controls the speed of the motor. An INA219 is placed between the battery and the motor. An LCD display shows the battery voltage, the motor's current, in amps, and the power consumption in watts. As I increase the speed, the motor draws more amps, and the wattage goes up. Here's the INA219 breakout board. It can measure voltage up to 26 volts. This board has a 0.1 ohm shunt resistor, which is labeled R100. The chip can very precisely measure the voltage drop across the shunt. This is the difference between the voltage coming into the resistor and the voltage afterwards. It can then use the voltage drop along with the value of the shunt to determine the current flow in amps because Ohm's law states that the current I equals voltage V divided by resistance R. The maximum voltage drop that the INA219 can measure is 320 millivolts, or 0.32 volts. Therefore, if we divide 0.32 volts by the value of the shunt resistor, 0.1 ohms, it gives us 3.2 amps. This is the maximum current that the INA219 can read with the default resistor. It's possible to replace the 0.1 ohm shunt with a lower value if you wish to measure higher amps. For example, a 0 0.01 ohm shunt would allow 32 amp current measurements. However, the lower value resistor would need to dissipate more heat, so we need to have a higher wattage rating. Power dissipation equals current squared times resistance. The board's default 3.2 amp rating means the 0.1 ohm resistor needs to be able to dissipate 1.024 watts, possibly more if the resistor is located near other components that generate heat. At 32 amps, the power equation shows that the 0.01 shunt would need to be able to dissipate 10 times more watts. Precision current measuring shunt resistors that can handle 10 watts are usually expensive and get pretty hot. Therefore, if you want to measure more than 3.2 amps, I'd look into a more efficient solution, such as the 30 amp Allegro ACS712, which uses a linear hall sensor approach. And please, exercise caution when working with dangerous currents. There are many applications for the INA219, such as measuring battery levels, estimating battery life, tracking solar power generation, monitoring the amount and cost of electrical consumption. You can use it to determine how much power is being used by the Raspberry Pi. The INA219 provides digital reporting using the I2C communication protocol. Unlike an analog sensor that provides a proportional value, the digital INA219 returns the actual numbers for the voltage, current, and power in volts, amps, and watts. I2C makes wiring the INA219 adapter to the Raspberry Pi very easy. The VCC pin is connected to a 3.3 volt pin on the Pi. The ground pin is connected to a ground pin on the Pi. The SCL pin is connected to the SCL pin on the Pi, which is GPIO3. The SDA pin is connected to the SDA on the Pi, which is GPIO2. Since the INA219 runs at 3.3 volts, no level shifting is required. You can also daisy chain multiple I2C devices using only the two GPIO pins SDA and SCL. Here's the INA219 on a breadboard. The VCC pin is connected to a 3.3 volt pin on the Raspberry Pi. The INA219 ground pin is connected to the breadboard's ground rail, which will later be connected to a ground pin on the Pi. The INA219 SCL pin is connected to the Pi's SCL pin, which is GPIO3. The SDA pin is connected to the Pi's SDA pin, which is GPIO2. And a ground on the Pi is connected to the breadboard's ground rail. That's all it takes to connect the INA219 to the Pi. Next, let's hook up a 16x2 LCD display to provide visual feedback. I have other tutorials specifically on LCD displays if you're interested. The ground pin of the LCD is connected to a ground on the Pi. VCC is connected to a 5 volt pin on the Pi. The contrast pin is connected to ground with a 4.7K ohm resistor in series to lower the contrast. You could use a variable resistor for adjustable contrast or no resistor for full contrast. RS is connected to GPIO21. The read-write pin is grounded to ensure write only. The enable pin is connected to GPIO20. The display will be used in 4-bit mode, so data lines 4 through 7 are connected to GPIO 16, 12, 7, and 8, respectively. The display's backlight LED anode is powered from a 5-volt pin on the Pi with a 51-ohm resistor connected in series to lower the brightness. And lastly, the display backlight LED cathode is grounded. Again, you can use a variable resistor with the backlight LED for adjustable brightness or no resistor for full brightness. Please note that some displays do require a resistor to protect the backlight LED, so please double check your datasheet. A 16x2 LCD display has been added to the breadboard. The ground pin is connected to a ground rail. The VCC pin is connected to a 5 volt rail, 
which will later be connected to a 5 volt pin on the Pi. The contrast pin is connected to ground with a 4.7K ohm resistor. The RS pin is connected to GPIO 21 on the Pi. Unlike the I2C lines, it doesn't matter which GPIO pins you use for the LCD control and data as long as you specify them in the code. The read-write pin is ground to ensure write only. The enable pin is connected to GPIO 20. Since we're using 4-bit mode, data lines 0 through 3 are skipped. Data 4 is connected to GPIO 16. Data 5 is connected to GPIO 12. Data 6 is connected to GPIO 7. And data 7 is connected to GPIO 8. The LED backlight anode is connected to a 5 volt rail with a 51 ohm resistor to reduce brightness. The LED backlight cathode is connected to ground. Unlike the schematic, I'm actually using an RGB backlight display, which has three cathodes compared to a single color display that only has one. The first cathode that I just hooked up is red. I'll leave the second cathode, which is green, disconnected, and hook up the third, which is blue. This should generate purple text. Finally, a 5 volt pin on the Pi is connected to the breadboard's 5 volt rail. This illuminates the backlight. It looks blue on the video, but the actual color is a deep purple. Okay, the LCD is ready to go. Connected to a bench power supply is an old 12 volt indicator lamp I picked up at a local surplus store. The lamp glows a cool emerald green. The voltage is only set to around 5 volts, and the supply's meter shows the currents around 350 milliamps, which is very inefficient compared to an LED, especially considering it's not running at half its rated voltage. The lamp will be a good test for the INA219. Added to the schematic are the indicator lamp and a 12 volt DC power source. The positive terminal of the 12 volt source is connected to the VN plus connector on the INA219. Next, the VN minus connector is connected to one of the leads on the indicator lamp. The other lead is connected to the negative terminal on the power supply. This closes the circuit and allows the current to flow. Finally, the 12 volt power source negative terminal is connected to a ground which is common to the Pi. In order for the INA219 to function properly, the power source being measured must share a common ground with the Pi. Red and black alligator clips are connected to the positive and negative terminals on my bench power supply. A red jumper wire is connected to the VN plus terminal on the INA219 breadboard. The other end of the red jumper wire is connected to the power supply's positive terminal using the red clip. Now for the green lamp. One of the leads from the lamp is connected to the VN minus terminal on the INA219. The other lead will go to the power supply's negative terminal. In order to share a common ground with the Pi, a black jumper from the breadboard ground rail will also be connected to this lead. The lamp lead and ground are twisted together and connected to the supply's negative terminal via the black alligator clip. When working with voltages higher than 3.3 volts, please be careful not to let the positive lines touch any of the pins on the Pi or the INA219 other than the VN. It would very likely damage your Pi or INA219. Now for the software. I recommend starting with a fresh install, the latest version of Raspbian and Jesse, and it's always a good idea to run sudo apt-get update and sudo apt-get upgrade. This ensures your Pi has all the necessary software used in the tutorial. I tested several Python libraries for the INA219, and the most reliable one is by Crispy2. Configuring the INA219 optimally is a bit involved, and Chris's library makes it very easy. The pip command to install the library can be copied right from the GitHub readme, and then just paste it into a terminal and hit enter. This one command installs the library and all necessary dependencies. The Adafruit Python LCD display library will be used to drive the LCD display. It too is quickly installed with sudo pip install Adafruit car LCD. Again, this handles the LCD library and all dependencies. Okay, that takes care of the software for the LCD and the INA219. Since the INA219 uses the I2C protocol, it's necessary to enable the Pi's I2C interface. From the Pi's main menu, click Preferences, Raspberry Pi Configuration. Click the Interfaces tab and locate I2C. Click the Enable button and then click OK to complete the configuration. To confirm the INA219 is working, in a terminal, type sudo I2C detect y1. The resulting table shows the INA219 is connected correctly at hex address 40. This is the default address for the INA219. If you want, there are jumpers on the board to change it. Multiple INAs can be connected to the Pi as long as they all have unique addresses. From the desktop, idle is launched. No special permissions are required. Then, a new file is created. From time sleep is imported. From the INA219 library, INA219 is imported. From the Adafruit LCD library, Adafruit car LCD is imported. An INA219 is instantiated. The value of the shunt resistor is specified at 0.1 ohms. 
This matches the value of the shunt on the breakout board. Max expected is set to 0.6. This is the maximum current that you plan to measure. The result will be inaccurate if the actual current is higher than this specified amount, but in general lower values will give you more accurate results. Therefore you want to pick a value slightly higher than the maximum current of the device being measured. You can always set it high to get an initial ballpark reading and then lower it to get better results. I already tested the green indicator lamp with a multimeter and it draws about 0.56 amps at 12 volts, therefore 0.6 provides a safe margin. Address specifies hex 40 for the I2C address, which we previously confirmed with the I2C detect utility. The default is 40, so this parameter is optional. The configure method sets up the INA219. Voltage range is set to 16 volts. This is the full scale voltage range. The options are 16 volts or 32 volts. Although the INA219 is limited to 26 volts. Since the indicator lamp is 12 volts, the lower 16 volt option is selected. Gain is used to program the INA219 calibration register in order to maximize the sensor resolution. Valid values are 1, 2, 4, or 8. Fortunately, Chris added an auto feature, which I'm using here that makes the setup even easier. Bus ADC sets up the bus analog to digital conversion resolution. 9, 10, 11, or 12 bit. Higher is better. Multiple sampling is also afforded for improved accuracy at the expense of slower reads. I don't care about speed, so I'm using ADC128 SAMP for 128 samples at 12 bit, which will take about 68 milliseconds per reading. Shunt ADC has the same guidelines as the bus ADC, but for the shunt, again, I'll use ADC 128 SAMP. Next, an LCD is instantiated. RS equals 21, enable equals 20, D4 equals 16, D5 equals 12, D6 equals 7, and D7 equals 8. Column and lines are set to 16 and 2 respectively for the 16 by 2 LCD display. The main program loop is wrapped in a try statement to catch errors. Variable V will store the voltage returned by the voltage method which pulls the INA219 for the bus voltage. Variable I will hold current in milliamps returned by the current method. And P will hold power in milliwatts returned by the power method. The LCD display is cleared with the clear method. Message displays the bus volts and amps on the display. Message again with backslash n for the next line on the display. Here watts are shown. P is divided by 1000 to convert milliwatts to watts. The loop pauses for one second and repeats. The library also provides sleep and wake commands, which I'm not using. They can reduce power usage. For example, if your project's running on batteries, you could take a reading every 30 minutes and power down the INA219 between readings to save battery life. Other commands I'm not using are overflow, it can detect an overflow in the current power calculations, which result in meaningless values. Shunt voltage, which returns the shunt voltage drop in millivolts. Supply voltage, which is the bus voltage plus the shunt voltage. And reset, which resets the INA219 configuration. Finally, accept is used to gracefully exit the program when a control C is detected. I'll save and run the program. The power supply is off, and the LCD shows zero for volts, amps, and watts. Hitting the power switch illuminates the lamp, which at 6 volts is drawing about 400 milliamps and consuming 2.4 watts. As I increase the voltage on the power supply, the lamp gets brighter and the LCD display readings go up. At 13.3 volts, the lamp is drawing about 596 milliamps and consuming 8 watts. Probably not good to run the lamp higher than its 12 volt rating. As I lower the voltage, the brightness and readings decrease. At 10.9 volts, the lamp is drawing about 537 milliamps and consuming 5.9 watts. The lamp is still quite visible in the 5 volt range, which will save electricity and will also run much cooler. This video was a request. I try to respond to all comments. You can support this channel by subscribing and leaving a like. Thanks for watching.